Like the original game, Dragon's Dogma 2 excels when you're out in its open world with your pawn allies, finding hidden caves and treasures, fighting monsters and generally losing track of time in this amazing game. Also like the original though, it falls short in terms of quest design, convenience and general polish. Travelling from town to town in Dragon's Dogma 2 feels like a daring expedition. It may take days, so don't forget your camping gear and enough restoratives or a healer to sustain you. Sure, if you really want fast travel, you can hop aboard an ox cart and nap through the ride, but you still might be rudely awoken by a bandit ambush and have to defend your bovine taxi before resuming your journey. And of course, ox carts are only handy when you're going town to town, not when you want to explore off the beaten track, dipping into caves, clam over hills and sniffing around ruins. Expeditions in Dragon's Dogma take so long not only because settlements are distances apart, but because the eye wanders towards scenery that has yet to be investigated or creatures that have yet to be slain. Before you know it, you're stuck in the wilderness, encumbered, exhausted, travelling by lantern light like swimming out to sea only to then realise you don't have the strength to return. That danger, however, is one reason that the grand sense of adventure in Dragon's Dogma 2 is near unparalleled. Another is that for all the risk your journey entails, the tone of Capcom's sequel remains as camp and as silly as the first game, a high fantasy that contrasts gloriously against the work of From Software and its souls-like acolytes. Arguably, it's especially enjoyable from a British perspective, not least because a good chunk of its world feels like one of the rocky areas of our countryside, like the Peak District perhaps, but with goblins instead of tea shops. Friends are an essential part of the ingredient that makes up Dragon's Dogma 2, and it's oddly compelling. In this case, as in the original game, those friends are called pawns. You can have up to three of these upbeat AI controlled companions by your side at once. Their sole purpose in life is to help you succeed. One of the three is your permanent main pawn, whose appearance, class and abilities you can select. The rest you summon from the Rift, in effect a server where copies of other players' pawns gather together, waiting to be picked for alternate adventures. Choosing auxiliary pawns from the Rift thus equates to borrowing other people's creations to fill out your party, and they may in turn use yours, which adds a wonderful communal touch to proceedings. And because borrowed pawns don't level up while working with you, it's necessary to keep swapping them for others, perhaps trying out different classes lineups. Do you stick to the basic or experiment, all the while gaining a window into what fellow Arisen have conjured from the detailed character creator and what kind of equipment they've discovered. As for the personality of the pawns, well, they can be quite irritating but nevertheless endearing. They're irritating chiefly because they talk too much jabbering on with hints and observations that may be painfully obvious or irrelevant to what you're trying to achieve. Their chatter also repeats a little too frequently, yet they're endearing in part because of this looping verbal diarrhea. What Capcom has done here is take the classic dumb RPG NPC and fold it into the lore of its game world. In particular, they buzz with joy at the sight of treasure chests, hilariously so when said chest is actually just a strong box in someone's house, which in their eyes is some great prize ripe for the plunder. Oh, and ladders. They love ladders. Pawns are not merely comedy cheerleaders, however. For one, they do point out interesting stuff you may have missed, including bringing information from other worlds they've travelled with other arisen. But most importantly, they'll fight tooth and nail for your cause, gamely charging towards the largest of creatures unless you beckon them away. And most of the time, you won't. Since combat is Dragon's Dogma 2's other strength, drawing on Capcom's own Monster Hunter series as much as any other RPG. In terms of your own participation in skirmishes, the game does a fine job of making each class genuinely different to play. As an archer, for example, you might use height and range to your advantage, while a sorcerer needs precious seconds to invoke powerful elemental spells. All are worthy choices. You'll likely try at least a few in the course of a playthrough, with bespoke special tactics and attacks to learn as you level up. Levitation lets a sorcerer reach higher ground or blast foes from beyond their reach, for example, while a thief can yank them around with a grappling hook. If you mix these skills together with some of your pawns, the result can often be merry chaos, especially against giant marquee monsters such as cyclopses, ogres and chimeras, which are even more magnificent to behold this time, and have a habit of dropping in unannounced. 
Sure, some dwell within foreboding caves where you'd expect to meet them, but now and again an enormous griffin might swoop out of the sky, or you might arrive back at the capital to find a city guard in a pitched battle with a cyclops that had presumably just wandered through the main gate and get to join in to bring them down. All of this improv mayhem is not without downsides though. At times you can be unreasonably swamped by gangs of enemies converging in a single area, and it's not so awe-inducing if that griffin plunges from the heavens when you're fully focused on fighting an ogre already crushing you under its talons. What's strange about this sequel is that in many ways it feels as if Capcom were happy to make the same game as it did over a decade ago, that is, a 2012 RPG rather than something more up to date. In short, this means you have to put up with an unevenness that seems less acceptable now than it did back then. For example, dialogue and cinematic scenes are haphazardly staged and directed. It's odd because there are some great physical systems in this world. You can collapse a rope bridge to send enemies to their doom, which in turn may force you to seek an alternative route. But other simple reactions don't register, such as trying to stop a minotaur charge by coaxing him into a tree. The biggest bugbear, however, is that certain archaic and sloppy features can cause you to waste a lot of time. The goofy writing might be charming coming from characters' mouths, for instance, but not so in poorly explained quest objectives, especially when accompanied by confusing map markers. Also, as magnificent as the long journeys can be, some quests aren't worth completing because fast travel options remain stingy even after you've opened up a good chunk of the map. Yes, you can zip instantly to any location that has a port crystal, and even place your own, but there are few and far between, and each trip requires a rare and expensive consumable. Considering that multi-part quests are often requiring you to return to their point of origin after waiting a few days, if you moved on by then, it's really more trouble than it's worth. Maybe there's something to be said for convenience after all then. Certainly you might wish for a little bit more when managing your inventory, or while fiddling through shopping and storage menus that aren't quite slick enough. You also might wish for some shortcuts to accumulating cash, since the cost of living crisis really seems to have bitten hard in this realm. Still, Dragon's Dogma 2 itself remains good value due to that unique vibe and its excellent expedition. Like its craggy landscape, you take the lows with the highs, the rough with the smooth. Sure, it's not quite the holy grail of RPGs, unless you're talking about the Monty Python film, but embrace the chaos and there's nothing quite like it. We give it three and a half stars out of five. Let us attack with the full sum of our strength. We must try to delay its course by any means!